Today we begin session three, Steps of Faith, Spiritual Disciplines. And we begin our study today with actually the discipline of study. 2 Timothy 2.15, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. As we begin today, let me ask you, can you correctly explain the word of of truth. If not, I would encourage you to dive in to this discipline. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is youthful, useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. So first, let's answer the question, what does it mean to study? Well, let me start with a couple of dictionary explanations of this word study. The first one is a state of contemplation. Secondly, application of the mental faculties to the acquisition of knowledge. Now, I, I must admit that as I read these definitions of study, I, I wasn't compelled by them. So I, I considered, what does it really mean to study? And this is my definition. Learning for the purpose of lifelong application. Learning for the purpose of lifelong application. So why should we study God's Word? Why is it important for us? Well, first of all, we study because it sanctifies us. It cleanses us. I remember the story of a grandson who was visiting with his grandfather. And they were out on the back porch that flowed from their property down to a brook. And granddad said, son, I want you to take that dirty old coal bucket and go down to the stream and get a bucket full of water and bring it back. Well, the son did. He filled his bucket up. He carried it up the bank to the back porch, but by the time he got there, there was very little water in the bucket. Unbeknownst to him, it had holes in it. So granddad said, go back down to the creek, get a bucket full of water, and maybe hurry a little faster this time. So grandson did, and he filled his bucket up. But even so, in rushing as quickly as those little legs would take him, when he got back, the bucket was less than half full. And, and the boy said, Granddad, with all my effort, I'm just, it, it's no good. It's, it's a waste of my time. But Granddad said, Son, I want you to look at the bucket. And the grandson did, and he said, Granddad, it's way cleaner. And the grandfather said, yes, that's right, grandson. That was the whole purpose. Friends, when we look into God's Word, we may not retain it all. We may not remember it. But it is still cleansing us daily. The second reason for studying God's Word is that as we learn, it prepares us for better uh, service. We study and we become not only better students, but better servants. I want to use the illustration, and this isn't my illustration, but I want to use the illustration of the hand today. 
How can we learn, how can we study God's Word? So I want you to to consider this in getting a handle on the Word of God. Getting a handle on the Word of God. The little finger represents hearing. It's the first and basic step to learning God's Word. To hear it. Hearing is important, but it's a long ways from being effective. The depth of your maturity in Christ is largely going to be how many fingers you have on the Word of God. Psalm 119 verse 9 through 11 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you know that in any 24-hour period if you read the Word of God, that you are going to remember 5% or less of what you read, what you heard, I should say. Hearing is good, but it is ineffective if left alone. If you're a Christian and you're only influence from God's Word is hearing it on a Sunday-to-Sunday basis, that's going to be pretty ineffective in your life. The second finger stands for reading. We call this the ring finger. Reading is a big step beyond just hearing. And I strongly urge you to read your Bible. Reading will help you retain 10 to 15% of all that you read in 24 hours. Now, that's not a big jump, but it's two to three times better than just hearing it. Now, if I had my Bible up here and I asked you to take it out of my hand and I only had these two fingers holding it, well, I'd be pretty ineffective to hang on to it. The third finger stands for study. And studying is a big jump from just hearing or reading. This step is a step of commitment. It's one thing to come to church and hear God's Word, and it's another thing to read it on your own. But to study it, whether alone or in a group, requires commitment and dedication. When you study, you retain 40% of what you studied in a 24-hour period. That still doesn't sound like a great deal, especially for just one day. But when you consider that it is eight times more effective than just hearing it, well, that's a big jump. We don't simply study to gain knowledge. We study to rightly divide the word of truth. Gaining truth imparts wisdom and translates to walking in God's ways. 2 Timothy 2.15, let's read it again. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker. One who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly understands, explains the word of truth. Step four 
is to memorize. This is your index finger, and memorizing requires the extra step of commitment. But this is an extremely important step. I started memorizing Scripture when I was a teenager, maybe 15 years old, and I memorized literally hundreds of verses. So that by the time I was 20, I could quote many passages of Scripture. Many of those Scriptures come back to me when I need them to to do a better job against the enemy, to fight against the enemy. His only power is in his lies, but our power is in the truth of God's Word. If you memorize properly, you retain 100%. Think about that. I memorized Titus 2.11. For the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men. I memorized that as a teenager. It's still with me. I still understand. It encourages me to share God's word with people. Why? Because it helps do battle against the enemy. The fifth finger is meditate. Now, Joshua 1.8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do you hear what this verse promises that meditating will do? We will be prosperous and successful. That's a great promise and should encourage us to meditate. Now, if I have my entire hand on the the Bible, if I hear, read, study, memorize, and meditate on God's Word, I will have a handle on God's Word, and it will be very difficult for the enemy to snatch that out of my hand. So I want to encourage you to become a student of God's Word. Your assignment for this week is to start reading a chapter a day. Now, if you're further advanced in your reading, or you want to take on the challenge of reading through your Bible in this coming year, you don't have to start January 1st. You can start today. And to read through the Bible in a year will take literally 3.27 chapters a day. So here's what I would recommend. I recommend that you read three chapters a day, but that when you come to the book of Psalms, because they're such short chapters, that you read five a day. And this will balance out your year and help you to read through the Bible in approximately a year. God bless you as you do this and you will see as you grow. Just like the coal bucket being cleaned, as you look back in your life, you'll be able to see the effectiveness of God's Word in your life. Discipline number two is evangelism and disciple-making. Now, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this today as we actually did a step of faith three-week step of faith uh, previously on evangelism, and we uh, talked through this in in great detail, and I encourage you uh, to get a copy of those and to go through them yourself if you would like to. But Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all nations,' baptizing them in 
the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples before he left earth. And this passage wasn't just to his 11 remaining disciples. It was written for all of us. Jesus called us to go and make disciples to all nations. And then he encourages us to baptize them. And he tells us, he gives us a hope for when we are feeling that we just can't do this. He says, and behold, I am with you always. What an encouragement to us. The focus of evangelism is faith in God. And the response is a decision to follow Jesus, which is usually marked by baptism and by joining a faith community. It's important for us to be sharing God with others. The hope that we have found in Jesus. Discipleship, however, is the process of learning Jesus teaching and following his example. Discipleship is different than evangelism. It starts by accepting Jesus. It continues as we study Jesus and his word. The focus of discipleship is Jesus Christ. And the response is an active movement towards Jesus. An active movement towards his teaching and following his example. Discipleship involves learning concrete behaviors and ideas. It's character and ethics that matter. In order for discipleship to happen, Christians must help other believers grow in their faith and values. It's a community project. It takes a body, or a, if you want to use the word village, to disciple properly. Let me uh, just say a few further words about evangelism. In my Steps of Faith evangelism series, I talked about three ways to evangelism, to evangelize. First of all, we must have a plan. And in uh, session one, I give you a biblical plan to follow. Secondly, I encourage you to tell your story, how you came to Jesus. We see this in many Bible figures, uh, especially in the New Testament. Three different times the Apostle Paul shared his testimony and it found its way to Scripture. I encourage you to tell your story. And then third, I talk about use hospitality. It's so important. When we invite people into our homes and have a meal with them, it opens the opportunity to share our faith with them. Your assignment for evangelism discipleship is to share the gospel with someone this week. Then try to make it a regular part of your walk through this life. The third spiritual discipline that we look at today is silence and solitude. Jesus made a habit of withdrawing to the hills or 
a lonely place or the wilderness or a high mountain or even the garden of Gethsemane. He went to these places before he chose the disciples, after he heard of his cousin John's beheading, after feeding the 5,000, after healing a leper, for the transfiguration, and, of course, to prepare for his passion. Richard Foster says, and I quote, The seeking out of solitary places was a regular practice for Jesus. So it should be for us. Ruth Haley Barton, in her book, Invitation to Solitude and Silence, says, and again I quote, My entry into solitude often feels like the hard landing of an aircraft that the flight attendant humorously describes. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until Captain Crash and the crew have brought this aircraft to a screeching halt against the gate. And once the tire smoke has cleared and the warning lights are silenced, we'll open the door and you can pick your way through the wreckage to the terminal. Well, that's quite humorous. But life is noisy and fast-paced. It feels as if when I go to my times of silence and solitude, that I'm approaching these times, well, I think this description describes it well. It's like slamming to a screeching halt. The smoke of clutter and distraction billows around me, and warning bells sound telling me that I have been in a bit of danger and it is a good thing that I'm on the ground. Picking my way through the wreckage of external distractions, I stumble off into a quiet place in the presence of the one who has been waiting for me. The one who loves me, no matter what kind of deceitful shape I'm in, and is so glad that I've made it home. I must say that this is my favorite discipline for myself. I love silence and solitude. I find that I so desperately need them in my soul. There's something both appealing and transforming about silence and solitude. Other than Jesus Christ, perhaps the greatest man under each covenant, Moses and Paul were both transformed through years in virtual isolation in a remote wilderness. And there are moments in our pressure cooker days when years of escape to some hidden place sounds wistfully compelling to the Christian spirit. The discipline of silence is the voluntary and temporary abstention from speaking. So that certain spiritual goals might be sought. Sometimes silence is observed in order to read, to write, to pray. Though there is no outward speaking, there are internal dialogues 
between yourself and God. The Bible gives us a picture of silence in heaven in Revelation chapter 8, which includes the admiration and wonder of all who are there to see the Lamb. Friends, we practice silence and solitude to admire our God and to sit in His wonder. The Bible helps us and guides us in these times. We talk about having a quiet hour. But are these times really quiet? Or do we just busy ourselves all over with things? Silence and solitude is listening. It's waiting on God to speak. Matthew chapter 4, 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into this lengthy period of fasting and solitude, 40 days to be exact. In Luke's account of this experience, it's interesting to observe that he says Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.1 That he, Jesus, being led of the Spirit into this particular discipline. It says... At the end of this, afterward, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Friends, I believe that we acquire God's power for living by spending time with him. I I just want to say about the, the discipline of solitude is it's the practice of waiting on God to act and complete his will. So our focus is on him and then he fills us. What solitude isn't is isolation like a monk. We are called as Christians to serve in the body of Christ. So our time of solitude is brief periods of time in our life so that we have power. We're recharged by God's Spirit as we go back to serving the body and sharing in our world. What happens when we don't practice this discipline? We'll miss out on a great way to build intimacy with God and maturity for life. We will be inundated with the inner chaos and outer stresses of life. But when we take this time to be alone with God we can find the peace of God that passes understanding. Your assignment is to spend an hour this week in silence and solitude. You can go to your favorite place in nature and be sure to leave your phone or other device on mute. Escape the busyness by spending time with God, listening for Him to speak. Don't use this hour to busy yourself. Sure, we can read a passage of Scripture, but don't spend the entire time because we want to hear from God. Let God's Spirit speak into your life. Our final spiritual discipline 
is the spiritual discipline of worship. Matthew 14, verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What does worship look like? Is it things that we do or the attitude of the heart? John 4.23 says, Yet a time, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What do you think it means to worship? In the Spirit, and in truth. Can we worship God alone? Luke 2.37, And then was a widow who, until she was 84, she never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. This widow lady learned to worship alone. Worshiping God when we are alone is important and a practice our Savior did regularly. How do you worship God alone? You can sing to Him. You celebrate who He is and what He's done in your life. You thank Him. You're giving your praise to God. Well, can we worship God corporately? Of course we can. Most don't associate corporate worship as a discipline. Perhaps this is because we view the discipline as something that starts with our resolve. So how could we say that corporate worship is a discipline? Well, Let's start by defining the phrase spiritual discipline. I realize this is our last session in spiritual disciplines, but it's important for us to go back to what is a spiritual discipline. The key text for defining spiritual disciplines is 1 Timothy 4.7. It says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. First, this verse shows us that Christian disciples are to begin with the resolve to be disciplined in their life, but discipline with a purpose. It starts with a command in Scripture. The spiritual disciplines are God's idea, not ours. Second, we see from this verse that Christian spiritual disciplines apart are, are completely apart from worldly discipline. As Christians, we discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. We don't discipline ourselves for the purpose of financial gain, power, control, or fame. We don't do it to make money. We discipline ourselves for spiritual gain. So, does corporate worship help us? For for gaining godliness? Of course it does. By spending time in the body singing together, reading his word, hearing his word explained is a great help to forming godliness in us. So how do we worship corporately? Well, Here are just a few ways that the Bible encourages us to 
discipline ourselves in corporate worship. First of all, show up. Now, I realize that as I share this, we are in a period of lockdown in our province, and meeting together at Christians just isn't allowed by the law. But when those laws are rescinded, we need to get back in the habit of coming together. Hebrews 10.25 warns us against neglecting to meet together. One pastor says that a member of his church that members of his church are expected to attend every Sunday. Well, friends, that's how I feel. I don't it doesn't matter to me if Bonnie and I go away on holidays. We aren't taking a holiday from God. Wherever we are, we go to church. We find a church to be at. Secondly, you not only show up, but you sing. This is a part of our worship to God. Psalm 47 verse 6 says, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. But I want to encourage you, Just just don't sing words, but think about what you're singing. So often we can come to church and be distracted. Don't let your mind wander off, but engage in worshiping God. Well, there are several other things that we can talk about, like posturing yourself. The Bible talks uh, a lot about posturing, whether it's bowing or clapping or dancing or lifting your hands. These are all ways that we worship, can worship God. We engage emotionally. Lamentations 340, verse 4, uh, sorry, yes, Chapter 3, verse 40 and 41 says, Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Sometimes I lift up my hands. It's kind of like I'm saying, here's my heart, Lord. I bow down before you. You're my creator. I worship you. Your assignment for worship is to spend time this week worshiping God alone. Focus on Him and bringing Him honor and glory. Well, thank you for joining us for these Steps of Faith Spiritual Disciplines. And I want to encourage you, don't make it just teaching to to your life and then forget about it, but begin to practice these disciplines in your life. God bless you.